It was early morning in Georgia. Long before daybreak, in a lone house at the edge of the forest, a boy lay awake with excitement, for this was to be an important day in his life. He had hardly slept the night before, but not his brother, Harry. In all fairness, you couldn't blame Harry. For him, it was just another day of work. But for the boy, it was the first day of his vacation from school, and he was going to make the most of it. father was still asleep, and he took care not to wake him. In the kitchen, his mother was making breakfast, and it would soon be ready. Though the boy and his family lived on a small farm, they were people of the forest. His father and brother made their living with the stroke of the axe and the pull of the saw. And today, for the first time, the boy was to work at their side in the forest. People often say, you're as old as you feel. Well, that day the boy felt like a man, and he was ready and anxious to prove it. Yes, it felt good to the boy, having wonderful people for a family. His mother, Mamie, a gentle woman who gave loving care to her family. His father, Louis, a kind man who was as wise as he was strong. And his brother, Harry, who worked hard and said little. Together, they were the Hunter family. For over 80 years, the Hunter family has owned this farm. The boy's grandfather and his father before him cleared this land and planted cotton and tobacco. But ever since James's father was old enough to lift an ax, he had been a woodsman, cutting and hauling logs. His tools were the simple tools of the forest the axe, and the two-handled saw. To James, like any other farm boy, there were two kinds of chores. Those he'd rather do, like harnessing the mare, and those he'd rather not, but did anyhow. 
muscles he was so proud of were hardened at the pump handle and strengthened by the weight of water carried in a bucket. The hunters owned a truck for carrying the cut logs to the mill and a mare called Lady who dragged the heavy logs from the forest. The hunters have always worked for themselves, not for wages, and their earnings depended on how hard they worked. And so on this day that James would always remember, he and his father and his brother set out for the forest. His chest swelled with pride, for today he felt like a partner in the firm of Hunter and Sons. As every morning, Lewis Hunter stopped down the road to talk to Archie Hodges and his helper, Adams. Like the boy's father, Mr. Hodges was a man of the forest. They were all good friends and neighbors, living by the code of the woodsman, respecting the unspoken pledge to help each other in time of need. The Hunters and the Hodges cut timber in the heart of Georgia's 20 million acres of woodland. This land belongs to many people, and so the woodsman must pay each owner for the rights to cut trees on his land. It was a short trip to the tract of land where the Hunters had arranged to cut trees, but the Hodges had a little farther to go. Pine trees stood up into the sky, straight and tall. Among them were some full grown, ripe for the woodsman's axe. A tree was chosen. It was crippled in the direction it was to fall.
only when this first tree lay on the ground was there work that a boy could do. Limbing the trees might not seem important, but it was help to James's father and brother. Another pair of hands swinging an ax meant more trees fell, for the boy was doing something that yesterday and the days before his elders had to do for themselves. is down and its branches cut away, the woodsman's job is only half done. For a felled tree is worth nothing so long as it lies deep in the forest. They could not bring their truck to the fallen trees, but with ladies' help, the trees could be brought to a clearing near the road. Then James was trusted with another job, that of measuring and marking the logs into six-foot lengths. That's the way logs for pulpwood are bought and sold in this timber country. As he marked them, his father and Harry sawed them. The smell of fresh pitch running from the saw cut filled the air.
logs was slowly taking shape when they heard a truck coming down the road. It was their neighbor, Archie Hodges, already on his way to the mill with a full load of logs. James asked his father if he could visit the Hodges to watch all his mechanical equipment cutting logs. But his father said, later. Now there was work to be done. High noon, when the hot summer sun beat down from the sky, did the hunters stop working. The time had come for lunch. Hunters ate, but didn't say very much. Father Hunter paid a feeble compliment to Mamie's lunch, but he didn't make James smile. James was in no mood for jokes, for there was something else on the boy's mind. Afternoon, most of the logs in the clearing were sawed and piled high on the truck. Yet there was room for half again as many logs. After working steadily since morning, nothing would have been more welcome than a rest. But then, Archie Hodges came back down the road with another full load.
Among the trees in the clearing, one stood taller than the rest. Why not cut it since it was so close, the boy asked. But Father Hunter said no. The tree had been left standing for a purpose and he explained what it was. The seeds in the cones that it dropped would take root and the tree would be mother to a new forest. But there were other trees older and sturdier, ready to be cut. Waiting for his work to begin, James thought about Archie Hodges and how fast he was able to cut and load. James decided to visit the Hodges and watch them work. watched Archie's helper Adams use the power saw. It cut through the trees like a knife through butter. With this power saw, it was no wonder that their neighbor felled three trees in the time the hunters cut one by hand. And instead of an aging horse, they used their tractor to drag the logs from the forest swiftly. Hodge's son, Donald, saw James and came over to talk. Both of them tried to act like grown-up men of the forest. Donald's father came over and invited James to stay, but James said he had to leave. Father Hunter and Harry were working just as he had left them. Bent low, the sweat running. The saw gnawing at the tree with a slow, steady snarl. Not at all like the power saw. The boy was sick at heart. in the forest was finally done. But the best time of day was yet to come, at least for the boy. For the first time, James was going to accompany his father inside the great mill which bought their lots. Big as it was, there was a friendly feeling about the mill. The boy's father was known and respected for the honest, hard-working man he was. The day's labor was carefully measured and a record made.
From the largest crane James had ever seen, a sling was lowered to cradle the load. In a moment, the logs were up and away, and all there was to show for a day of sweat and toil was a piece of paper folded away in Father Hunter's pocket. Father and son were on their way into the cashier's office when Tom Reese pulled up. He lived 10 miles up the road from the hunters, but close enough to be called a neighbor. Even before the truck rolled to a stop, his power saw caught the boy's eye. People see beauty in different things. To James Hunter, that saw with its shiny blade and slim wheels was a thing of beauty. To Tom Reese, it meant something else. More logs with less work. Archie Hodges was paid for three loads of wood. Reese was paid for three loads of wood. But the hunters, who had worked harder than the rest, received a third as much pay. If the boy was sad for his father, there was no need to be. Lewis Hunter had courage. With your help, he joked, we'll soon be making twice as much. James finally asked his father, why couldn't we own a power saw like Tom Reese and Archie Hodges? His father had a ready answer. They couldn't afford it. A saw like Tom's cost a great deal of money, and they were still paying for their truck, which was the most essential piece of equipment for their work. On the way home, James tried to think how they could save enough money to pay cash for the saw. But the idea seemed impossible. He concentrated so hard on the problem that his father had to cheer him up. didn't know it, but he had planted a seed in his father's mind. That evening, Father Hunter called his family together. He told them that as a group, they were living within their means, spending the joint earnings mostly for things that were needed. Seldom was there money for the extra things. So long as Hunter and sons cut trees by hand, 
there was little chance of bettering themselves. With a power saw, they could triple their earnings. But to get a saw meant working harder and making sacrifices. The money belonged to all of them, so it was up to all to decide. On that summer evening that will live in the boy's memory, James knew what the family's decision would be. his homemade bank, the hunter fund to buy a saw was started, and James, self-appointed keeper of the fund, made the collection. Saturday, the hunters made a trip into town. took them by the Reese's, their distant neighbors. Tom's wife, Annie, had a sewing machine, much to the envy of all the women folk. Mother Hunter had put away a little money in the hopes of buying one someday, but now her savings were in the homemade bank. At the end of the road was the town where the hunters bought their supplies and met their friends. one particular friend. Yes, it was difficult to put aside the desire to buy things only because the money was being saved for something else. harder for Mother Hunter than any of the others. Her heart had been set on a sewing machine for a long, long time.
Mother Hunter soon discovered that shopping on her new low budget meant doing without some of the pleasant but unnecessary delicacies. left town taking only what was needed. Not a cent was spent for anything they could do without. Each coin dropped in the jar was a personal sacrifice. But it wasn't hard to make, because it was all being done for the common good of the family. All through the summer, the hunters were in the forest by daybreak. With these extra hours, they toiled harder and longer. was a day's work, was finished and on the way to the mill by mid-afternoon. until dusk they kept at their task, doing three days' work in two.
the hunter truck was always last at the mill. They became a familiar sight to the workers on their way home at closing time. And the man at the measuring station always greeted them with a smile because he understood what they were trying to do. To the one on high, the hunters gave thanks for their daily bread. But to Mother Hunter went words of praise for making food that cost little taste good. And after the meal, there was one extra course that gave more pleasure than cake. day, week upon week, hard work filled their lives. put them closer to their goal, until one day... to get the precious truck out of danger.
Father Hunter found it difficult to find words to express the gratitude in his heart. had saved their truck, they still had suffered a loss. Many logs that would have meant money at the mill were charred and worthless. But Father Hunter was as sensible as he was good. So long as they had their strength, they could always cut more logs. And this they did. By the time the first jar was filled and set aside for the second one, the fire was dim in their memory. It was cotton picking time, and this year the little farm had given a bumper crop. The hunters had watched over it like a proud hen caring for its chicks. The money was collected and went straight into the jar. long in coming, but finally the day arrived when the records James had been keeping showed they had reached their goal. The hunters sat down to count the money they had earned and saved together. As keeper of the hunter fund to buy a saw, James was given the honor of final addition. The sum of all those bills and coins gave the happy answer they wanted to hear all these months.
Yes, the saw was all they expected. The whine of its blade and the purr of its engine became music to their ears. The two-handle saw, long admired, was forgotten. By continuing to work from daybreak to dusk, Hunter and Sons were able to deliver a load of logs to the mill three times each day. And now, when Father Hunter turned in his slips, he received as much money for one day's work as he used to get for three. It was a good thing, good for all of them, and it showed in many ways. There was extra time and money for things they could never do before. And when there was finally enough money, Hunter and Sons didn't forget an obligation long postponed. Mother Hunter, who had given so much, was at last to get what she wanted most. Father and sons had never seen Mother Hunter happier, and because of it, they were all the happier. It may seem foolish to polish and caress a machine of rubber and steel, but not to the hunters. For them, the saw is a symbol of something warm and friendly. It had joined them together as a family so that they might better themselves. They are better not only because of the extra food and luxuries they are able to buy. They are better because in working for a common good, they have strengthened the family bond. For out of their achievement was born a new love, a deep affection, and a greater respect for one another. 